laugh. I'm always fixing Hi. the camera. <laughs> hey, how are you? Yay, I am so good. Oh my God, you have your makeup on. You look so beautiful. Hi. And nowhere to go. And no, <laughs> I'm just pressing. <laughs> but I'm happy to be I. here. Thank you so much for having me. Okay. This is going to be a non-traditional media whatever, okay? Because um, I just feel like I, not that I've been living in a bubble for 10 years, but I'm just kind of tired of the routine. I'm tired of like having scripts and having to say things in a certain way. I get the whole professional thing, but I just feel like during this time with COVID that I just want to have uh, conversations with my friends and my sisters and, you know, and those business associates whom I admire. I just want to have these conversations to inspire those who may be in the dark. Um, and maybe they may hear something that resonates and helps them along their journey. I don't have um, a bunch of like questions or anything like that. I simply just wanted to flow however it flows but I definitely yeah I remember I reached out you. to you and said we should definitely do an IG live and yeah. just talk because when we have our private conversations it's so real right. and then you know I am the same way I watch these interviews and I can't watch media anymore because right now I mean yes this PR stuff is beautiful we can get into it uh -huh. but it's some real stuff happening right now and if you ain't talking about our liberation it's not time to be PC. And I'm a publicist saying that. It's just sometimes I need for my clients to be honest. You know what I'm saying? I need for some honesty. But I try to be that. You know, maybe they can't. Maybe they don't know mm -hmm. how. And mm -hmm. so I think there's a way um, you can do it. And I just I have to bring back Colin Kaepernick. You know, I was like, oh, he's pulling a publicity stunt when I first saw that. Because I used to work with him. So I, I remember... When Cap first hit the scene, he was humble, then he got proud, and then he was like militant. And I was like, All these different people. Yeah, those, like. that's the kind of clients I like. Those are the type yeah. of people I like to work with. But yeah. his, it was his press interview that let me know it was real. Because I'm like, okay, what is he kneeling for? You know, some all eyes matter. And then he said it. And when he was telling us what he was kneeling for, he did it again. And I was just so proud because I was like, that's how you use your platform. That's how you. <laughs> get change, real change in the world. So for the people that I work with, hi everybody, my name is Lila Brown. Yes. And my company's EB Media Group, Team EBMG. And I work with Olympians. And they have a platform on a global scale. But I will say this, maybe people don't realize, um, you know, the impact of a lot of the protests that's been going on. But I can tell you, in terms of the Olympics, everyone refers to that on the podium, Black Power Fist, John Carlos at the 1968 Games. So I'm so proud to work in the Olympics today. And he's still around. And because of a lot of the protesting and a lot of the Black Lives Matter that force, the International Olympic Committee, the U.S. Olympic Committee has to now say we cannot allow, or well, we cannot penalize athletes for protesting or kneeling. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of athletes calling BS on that and thinks it's just politics, but we'll see. But I would really like, you know, I had one athlete after she punched her ticket to the Olympics, meaning she, made, she passed the Olympic trials, she was top three in her event, and mm. she just started using the opportunity to speak about police brutality because she had lost a family member. So sometimes those things are not even coordinated, but, to, you know, but I really do, I just tell my athletes to be honest, and if you want to figure out a, a better way to craft your messages, then absolutely, like, for sure, let's work it out. And how... That's another thing, like some people don't really understand how important it is to actually have a publicist um, for your company when things like this come about, where you can construct it in a way that you're relaying the message in the way that you want it to and not someone able to take that narrative and make it something else. Well, I mean, I think that's the PR for me. Mm, uh, right. Public relations, it's, to me, it's also the pre, the P-R-E, mm. it's preventative. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you were waiting, so, I mean, this is crisis communications 101. Yeah. You know, when you bring a new product to market, you think about worst case scenarios. And in the event of working, us working with talent, I got to get to know your mama now. I need, you got kids, you got some baby mamas in hiding. I have, I'm sorry, but I got to know all your business. <laughs> I promise her speakers yeah. are safe with me, but let's keep it confidential. You know, mm -hmm. I need to know as much because if it does leak the press, it's nothing worse than, and this has happened to me way too often. 
you know, athletes that I'm working with, they don't really value or maybe some talent, they don't value what a publicist is. But when they go on a date or they sing canoodling mm -hmm. or seen at the same hotel or something, I mean, TMZ is such and such sleeping with such and such. Who said that? <laughs> God, hey, it's six o'clock in the morning. Let me wake up. Yo, such and such was on a yacht with one of the Jenner girls. <laughs> The Jenner girls are saying that they're dating. Is it true? Yeah. No, it's not true. So sometimes the, the paparazzi's waking me up out of my sleep. I call them paparazzi. Mm -hmm. the, the TMZs and the Entertainment Tonight's are waking me up trying to get the scoop. I mean, girl, it's been everything from such and such has had domestic violence. I'm like, yo, I'm calling my phone. Like, we hitting women now? Like, I'm, I'm getting the So right now, because of social media, a lot of talent may feel like they don't need a publicist. You know, yeah, like right. they might tweet something out and they didn't really think it out. But we seen the event with Nick Cannon. That was a well-produced show. But you know what I'm saying? So as a publicist, I would have never told my clients to apologize something that empowers our people. I'm just, I'm just a different type of publicist. Right. But <laughs> that's another one. I would have never apologized. And I, I need somebody, I, that's why I said, what if Colin Kaepernick would have apologized? So I'm, I'm the type of person, I tell my client, hey, you put it out there, do you mean it? Did you mean what you said? All right, I will support you. And I'm telling you, a lot of times sponsors will jump ship. A lot of times partners, media don't. I don't, I don't care. I believe in my clients. So if that's how they feel, uh, most of the time it's in alignment with how we really talk into, like when we have those real conversations. So I can't tell them to lie. And I just, I'm just really fed up and I'm just stop lying to black people. That's just how I feel right now. Just stop lying to our people. We've been through so much. We're healing. And what we, what we don't need is someone else lying to us. I'm just beyond that. That is so true. What about, um, what do you think the state of media is right now with the COVID? Because, you know, for me being a publicist in music, taking a break, I took a break <laughs> and came back. Um, I feel like a lot of the artists that I've spoken to, I don't know if it has anything to do with COVID. A lot of times, it's very difficult. It's the shutdown you're talking about, maybe. Yeah. And a lot of artists don't even like working with Black PRs. All right. Yeah. So, that's, I mean, did you, did you want to go on? Did you want to go on? Let's go on. Let's go on with that. I, um, I find that I could probably start with an artist, maybe. I need someone to fully trust me with my plan and strategy and be on board with it that we're all on the same path so that it can work. And a lot of times what happens is if it's not happening overnight or they not getting whatever it is that they well, expect. I don't know. Like it's, it's it's, well, I'm going to tell you so what much. it is. It's, 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 everybody wants to use the Black community as a stepping stone. Everybody wants us to use, to work yeah. with us when, for cheap labor or even sometimes unpaid because you're trying to work right. off commissions on some, like I do some marketing right. deals as well. Mm. Our people got to get back into some self-love because they still think that the Jewish way is the way to go about it. Never mind years of funding enslavement, never mind years of lynching, decades of disenfranchising and declassifying mm -hmm. our people, right. telling our people we from Africa, <laughs> telling them we from this, and we, our people are still needing their validation. Look at how we all one minute Black Lives Matter, and everybody's like, yay, Netflix is showing our reruns. I love it. Fin syndication, yeah. get that money. Awkward. Or the next day is <laughs> Emmys. Now we're, I thought we were in the process of building our own award shows. I thought we was in the process yeah. of, you know, getting our, our properties up. So, I think our people at the end of the day still want, they still want that white validation. It's nothing worse than to see an athlete or a celebrity or a musician saying Black Lives Matter. Oh, I got a small mm -hmm. Black-owned media outlet that wants to talk to you. Nah, I want to be in Forbes. You know Steve Forbes funded apartheid in South Africa. Nah, they want to be up in the GQs and the Esquires, but they don't want to reach out or they don't even I mean, I literally had NBA athletes. I've seen them do know-nothing white boy blogs. And then turn down a podcast with four or five brothers who really have respect for the game, who have played the game, who actually have respect for them as human beings and brothers and sisters. And they don't want to do those interviews. So when I start to realize that that's the type of client I'm about to get, I, it's a choice too. It's, 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 it's two a signatures choice. on that contract. That's true. 
I have a choice. Do I even want to work with you? And I, of course, I have some clients that are like, oh, here goes Lila, militant. <laughs> but when they get racially attacked, they, they lean it on me. What do I do? I was racially attacked. My coach, can't find my coach is goddamn racist. I told you, 2016, they're all Nazis. Mm -hmm. Lila, what do I do? So everybody wants to lean on us. I want to support a black business, but that doesn't bring Breonna Taylor back. What, what's going to prevent the next shooting or hostile incident is stop funding the police. Stop using our labor to, for capitalism. That's a whole nother discussion. But it's <laughs> a whole very, nother very discussion. deep. So our right. people at the end of the day still hold white as supreme. They still hold our opposition, our enemies. I'm trying to be equal, and you know what I call them on my broadcast. <laughs> Still trying to be equal. I'll just call them colonizers today. I want to be okay. equal with the people who need my slave labor. I want to sit at the table with mayonnaise culture. I'm sorry. I'm, I have my own table. We have hot sauce. I digress. You know, it's just like, I'm, I'm so over it. If you got a client or a potential client, it takes two or three meetings. I'm not, my resources are infinite in this industry. People want my Rolodex. People want my connections. Most of the times, the people that was telling my clients no two or three years ago get fired because they don't own their business. I own mine. So then I always get that email, hi, I'm, I'm Becky Karen, and I'm taking over for the Karen Becky, and I'll be your new account rep for this brand that told you no years ago. <laughs> and now they want to be my best friend because they, they don't understand that Becky, that Becky Karen before her was always telling me no. Yeah. So it's longevity and patience, especially if I, my bulk of my clients are in the Olympics. Mm -hmm. um, I have musicians, NFL, NBA, but the bulk of them mm -hmm. are in the Olympics. So I'm cool with waiting every two to four years for people to catch on to a Gabby Douglas or a Simone Biles. Right. You get know what I'm saying? So yes. I'm very patient. And uh, because of that, I'm not thirsty for clients. And they can yeah. read that. They can read my passion. Because we, we melanated people. We can read each other's energy. They can tell <laughs> you, like, you're hungry or you're passionate. You're enthusiastic. I want somebody you're on right. my team who's enthusiastic about my brand. I'm just the same way when I'm pitching. So it's like, um, I can get you in GQ, but it's okay, then what? I can get you in Vogue. Okay, now what? You know, what? it's much more, it's much more bigger yeah. fish to fry. <laughs> I'm cracking up because someone recently sent me something and it was like a list and I'm like, yeah, we can do that. That's easy. Like getting in the publications and getting like people think that getting on TV is really hard and it's really not that hard at all. Working with I mean, when you're working with journalists, um, uh -huh. if, if, when you start to build that relationship, but like journalists are snobs nowadays. Um, when you start talking about the Vogue's and the GQ's. Yeah. Um, but then I just got a random call from the Ellen show yesterday who wanted one of my former clients and I am two years later. <laughs> hi. Cause I like, I haven't already done billions of dollars worth of people. See, the thing is this, right. for some of my that clients, so you know, we trade out, I, I work commission, whatever. Uh -huh. I get them on all these platforms. And then uh -huh. when they're no longer working with me, they're like, Hey, where did all the publicity go? Where did all the endorsements and the red carpet events go? They don't understand the value. So what we should do as PR professionals, practitioners, is start to say, hey, you know how you just got a half a page article in said magazine? Well, if you were to pay for that, that's about $15,000. Half a page. Could you please So we say have to quantify again? it with ad our advertising <laughs> rates, which is not fair because this right. is earned media versus paid media. Right, exactly. Earned. <laughs> Merit based. And that's what's changed. So now what I do is I just go ahead and, and I learned this in journalism school. Just go ahead and write the article. We, mm. we took journalism classes, so we know how to write for media. Just go ahead and write the who, what, when, write it out for them. And then nowadays, journalists just copy and paste. They're not even fact checking nowadays, especially when it comes to entertainment. They don't check sources. You can tell somebody you made a billion dollars this quarter. They don't and check. Have, oh, yeah, that's true, as we've seen So recently. press releases are powerful. <laughs> Tweets will get a lot of people in trouble. Um, mm -hmm. And people think of PR as somebody that's telling you what to do or going to help you spin some BS into sunshine, mm -hmm. where it's more so let's think about these things. Let's think about your brand maybe six months before an album launches, maybe three months before. Let's like talk about pre-publicity, then there's a yeah. publicity that you do during the active phases, and then you do mm -hmm. post-publicity, the recaps, and how did things go, and the assessment. 
So it's stages, it's levels. <laughs> it's definitely levels. And I love, I love the six month plan. Like it, it helps me because I'm always feeling like I'm light years way far apart than what's presently going on. You're like 10 years ahead. <laughs> right, exactly. You're like post-career. Because <laughs> okay. I'm like, now we're in this digital world. You always have to bring me back because I got super ADHD. But I always think like, why can't we look ahead and start getting people excited and ready for what's to come? Like, why do we got to hit it? with them in three months and they were trying to figure out why the record sales were, were the way they were. Yeah, everybody's much too in a rush and they're not patient and they want it now. They want instant gratification and that's mm -hmm. fine. We, but you know how many times people come to me haven't had a photo shoot yet? So, you know, that, they don't look at it as the, the consultation leading up to activate. You can't activate with me just because you got the money. <laughs> and you know, in, in the music industry, everybody got some money. You know, they, 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 they need to reinvest into something legit. So, right. <laughs> nah, go get your photo shoot. Go do your promo. Go, there's some other things you need to be doing before you activate. And so I think when they start to recognize that I'm not money hungry, but I love money. Don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. But oh, I ain't thirsty. So when they right. start to realize that, for one, I got way too many clients. I got, I got deals growing. I need to be concentrating on. And then I still need my personal time. Because when you are independent, Oh, I'm wake. Like I said, I'm waking up. TMZ's waking me up sometimes, asking me questions. So it is my life. I don't get. I mean, I don't really do holidays anyway. But I don't get. Most people in the PR world don't get holidays. we think about it on Thanksgiving, right? If you're working in consumer products PR, Thanksgiving, yeah, you might get that day off, but you know the next day is Black Friday. So you're trying to get your clients' brands out there, and then Cyber Monday. So right. you you gotta you gotta be on it. And so many times when PR first started out, people were doing automatic tweets, and then a tragedy would happen, and then a tweet would be like, hi! And everybody would be like, wrong time, what? wrong timing. <laughs> it would just be the wrong message, and while everybody was mourning, they're like, get your, you know, they would say something so inappropriate, 50% off. But you can, like, tell, no, you can tell, though. You can feel it, so, though. So it's just like, we have to be in real time. That's, that's just what PR is today. I want to catch the question before we miss it. What's your advice for entrepreneurs transitioning to cons consultants versus uh, storefront business owners? You can. You want to take a crack at it? <laughs> I'll get it. I'll take it. That's hey, swell with small rail. How are you today? It says, what's your advice for entrepreneurs transitioning to consultants versus? Okay. Oh my gosh. No, I feel like consultants is just uh, what you should be doing. What you should be transitioning to, and you're trying to go from a storefront business. like a boutique yeah. or a restaurant and. Yes, because there's so many startups that need your expert advice. So you kind of think, I always think it's consultant is the person that has all the experience and they know all the nuances of things. They know how to exactly. help you get through that little hump as a new business or some challenges you're going to meet. Like, for example, if you're a storefront restaurant and all of a sudden, you know, you lose your license. Okay, this is what you need to do to get it back because you've been there, done that. So I think that's a great way to transition your career after, you know, you've moved on. We, we, there's cycles, you know, there's cycles. So you, you may not be active all your years, 10, 20 plus years into something. Your expert advice is greatly needed to that new startup or to that emerging designer or that, you know, that new person on the scene. So, uh, yeah, consultation is great. And you can charge more and you can charge hourly. And don't be afraid to hit them with like a $200 <laughs> some astronomical fee, you know? Because then when you start giving free consultation, then people will, you know, normally my consultation fee is $1,500 an hour, but I'll give it to you for free. And then they're like, oh, value. We need to be talking about the value of our work because it's so, it, it ends up being like what we're doing right now. It ends up being, cons you know, consultation and advice. But this is million, this is million dollar, billion dollar advice. This is the type of, work that helps people become millionaires and billionaires and, and because of bad pr you can also lose your money so we're also about preventing problems but also sustaining success in just my opinion <clears throat> yeah i always feel like once i started talking by that time i had already built my career now i can talk about pr and now i can talk about media relations and relationships with the journalists for me for me getting on TV, I skipped past the journalists and I started connecting and looking at the credits and who 
who was the producer for the show. Mm-hmm. Like I always look for the producers and the executive producers, even when I'm booking producers, a movie. talent bookers. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm also looking for the casting director in the credits on TV. I'm like, oh, I got, okay, I got to find out who, who is that. Because I don't know. I'm real irritated. I don't have time for someone to say, oh, wait, let me see what they're going to say and if they're available. And No, I need to speak to who's making the decision because I don't have time. I just don't have the time for that. I, I don't know. It's something about that. No, I used to, when I started on PR, that's one of my mentors. She would go over, like if she was doing a sponsorship package, she mm-hmm. would go over the marketing director. She would go to the CMO. She would go to the, sometimes the CEO, if it was a small, large business, you know, like, yeah. and then they would send it down, like, to an assistant, like, take care of this. By that time, it's already been yes, because you got to think about CEOs don't get hit up with the mundane stuff. And then she's right. like, I'm going to hit you with something mundane so he can send it back down. That means it's already been approved. It's been passed down to the intern or the apprentice. <laughs> and welcome. that's how we get our sponsorship. <laughs> And you're welcome. You don't even you don't even got to do your job. I got yeah, you. uh, it's already done. So that's what we're supposed to be doing as PR is to yeah. is to you know if somebody says I don't like what this journalist wrote about me, well your PR person should have led them in the right way. Maybe your PR person should have gave more access. You can't. I've seen people do these satellite tours. Or you only get 15 minutes with Denzel Washington. You only get 15 minutes with Lena Waite, and it's like you expect the journalist. journalist I have told her journalists say it takes me an hour to get warmed up. I was like, well, you better go in the bathroom and start talking to yourself because you need to get warmed up. You need to be warm by the time that the celebrity gets here. Yeah. We don't have time. But you want, but as a PR person, I would never like, especially with black on media, if I facilitate the relationship, I mm-hmm. would I would really have to sit down. And it doesn't happen all the time, but in an ideal world, I would love to sit down with the talent and say, I need for you to give a little bit more respect. And so that's why a lot of people say black media is so mean. Like, I think Nicki Minaj said that, like, black media is very, you know, like, Wendy Williams, very catty. But maybe we're just not giving enough access. You know, like, a Martin Bashir or Oprah Winfrey will go walk around with their subjects and go to their home and, you know, spend a day or two with them. Let them open up so I can only show the best sides of this part or the more open side. Make them feel comfortable. And so a lot of times, I mean, that's, in, that's what happens. Um, you're just not, they're not getting enough time, so they don't like their write-ups. And then it's like, well, they didn't even get time to ask you about your album. Like, what, what was the concept? But by the time you talk about who you work with, the producers, and your background story, you didn't really talk about the conceptual piece, the visual <laughs> arts to your, your work. That is so interesting that you bring that up, because I was going to ask about why does the Black media get passed over at like you know at the big events at the grammys and oscars and stuff like that like why do they get like no well no you're right they do get pushed if they do get accepted they push them to the end of the line they just don't see them as big publications they i I look at our media as elite it's very niche it's very like very direct and it has a Mm -hmm. certain market like you know black hollywood black tree tv is like black hollywood shadow and act there's certain types of stories, but because, and, and, I, and I actually had a little Becky Karen tell me, because I said, why don't you, y'all invite more black media to the to Team USA Olympic events that y'all do have in the States? Because so, right. so many events are international. What about the ones in the States? She told me, we don't think black media can afford to even come out here. We don't think that they can afford it. They don't see us as viable um, I guess, partners to say, hey, we're doing something in Atlanta. You know, a lot of black media there. I still see black media excluded in Atlanta. We're doing something in um, Colorado Springs. We're having a big event. Most of the times, with the, and maybe they're right, the editor is not going to fly a journalist out. So you know what I do? Because there isn't black media there, I take it upon myself to start servicing the black media. I can be the content distribution. So if I go to a red carpet event, let me, I'll take pictures of my clients for sure. Mm-hmm. But let mm-hmm. me go get a picture of this client on the red carpet real quick. Maybe it's Halle Berry doing a movie premiere. I get one on my cell phone. I can blast it out to some of my five favorite bloggers. And they're like, thank you so much. I wasn't there. I wasn't even invited. 
and you just did this as a courtesy. Yeah, but also here's a picture, some pictures of my clients you can throw in there. I used to do that for Nicole Bitchy, the YBF, when a lot of the black bloggers were just starting out. And they're powerhouses now. But I just, I really wish they, they could do more, but I can be the help that I want to see. I want to be that change in the world. So let me be that. I'm at the event. There might not be any black media there. Let me take some pictures for them, disseminate some content. I can even write them up, give them the who, what, when, where, why, how, what's going on, and some little juicy gossip if they want to share that. Mm -hmm. And then they have a post for the day. And so then you start to build your relationship. So we gotta, we have to sometimes where it's, we gotta work both sides. We are the middlemen. We gotta work on the client side, then we gotta work on this side and servicing the needs of the media. That's a, that's a bit much. <laughs> <laughs> it is, but it's fun because I'm so no, it's, it's I'm not bored. Fun. Like, I'm <laughs> like, <laughs> But see, I just so started easy. doing events just a past, like these past couple of years. For the longest, I was like totally 110% behind the scenes because I just wasn't with it. Like, I, I don't know. I just wasn't with all of the, the, the glitz and the glam and the cameras and the action. But then when I finally did go, for shame like Tyrese did the short film shame and I went and I was like wow this is like so much fun this is so cool because I now I've, I've walked away with like 50 more different business relationships I have to think of this as a business not as the glitz and the glam this is where the relationships are created and not just for the free started. food most times I'm I and am <laughs> bored I'm like nobody cares about this premiere oh, like, really, after while, black media does not care about a lot of things thing. and I'm just like Thank you for the hors d'oeuvres and the champagne, yeah, because I'm over it, too. I get you. <laughs> that is so funny. Um, I don't, it's so funny. I was reading something earlier about, it was like the National Black Associations of Journalists, and they did like this research thing on the Black media. It's mostly us in Hispanics that are the majority of the people that's watching the media anyway, right? We're consuming, we're like, we, we eat the, like we actually eat the media. We are major <laughs> consumers. Our consumption is by the second. I think sometimes we just want to be the first to say, boom, you know, that everybody wants to be the first. So I could, I could believe that. Um, we are addicted to social media. We are addicted to Twitter, but mm. Brands look at that and they see our demographics. They see, they look at, oh, my audience is 80% black, but what are they still gonna do? They still gonna give us that white images. They still gonna give us images I was just gonna say, they're the, still in control of the narrative. Of so, but the thing is, I, I have to, you know, again, be the change I wanna see in the world. I have to yeah. be that, that I wanna mm -hmm. see. So, you know, make sure we put out good images. You know, I'm really excited about this Beyonce, Lion King spinoff she's doing. Oh yeah. Black Even if I'm not a big fan mm -hmm. of her work, <laughs> which I'm gro she's growing on me. <laughs> but I can I can appreciate the visualization and something seeing our people as royalty and seeing our people as high society and fancy and dolled up and very like Victorian fashion mixed with some African yeah. prints. You know. So the thing is, is like they know we consume the media and they know. If we indoctrinate them, we can get them to buy our products. So why do I hear more rappers talking about Versace than I do Pierre Moss? Why do I hear more of our sisters talking about Jimmy Choo as opposed to Brother Valleys? Why do I hear these people talking about, oh, I got Diane von Furstenberg, but they ain't talking about Tracy Reese? We need to really kind of reprogram and deprogram and really understand, like, what are we saying? You know these people copy us. You know they, they stalk us on social media. They want to look like us and dress like us. So I'm trying to look like the people that want to look like me. So then just be yourself. And that's what I realized, too. Because I, when I used to go back and forth to California, I was like, oh, my goodness. And then I was like, oh, that doesn't matter. How I feel about myself is what really counts. That's what really matters is how I feel about myself. Silly. Like, this is conversation. Well, and that's myself. why when I went to journalism school and then I got into more of the propaganda side of it, I was like, oh, that's what you've been doing to my people. <laughs> Silly. <laughs> Great. And now that I'm in it and people get upset because I'm breaking the spell because I'm waking them up and I'm like, yo, people want to be lied to. And I get it, especially our people. They just... They want somebody to pander to them. I, I think it was really weird when people were talking about like Kamala Harris or what. She's just pandering to black people. We deserve to be pandered to. Somebody should be offering us the top 
tip of the hat, best customer service. So yes, mm -hmm. pander to me, but do not lie to me. Don't trick me. I either like it or I don't. You don't have to, you know, I, was, I watched an ad or some type of uh, old school throwback video. They were saying how malt liquor was sponsoring so many rappers in the 90s. So it, it got real corny. Yo, yo, my malt liquor. I pour it as a go. Yo, yo. And the shit was corny, <laughs> but they was getting paid. And they didn't give a shit about how they were <laughs> affecting the black community until I think like a, a public enemy would just call them out or somebody called them out and they stopped it. So we, we really got to understand that the media is a, a propaganda tool used to convince us to, when you are at the store and you don't have that TV in front of you, remember, buy malt liquor. Remember, buy Ford. Remember, choose Kmart. Remember, stop by McDonald's. It's all this, so when, it's, it's, it's subversive. It is uh, subliminal messaging. So when you are away from your TV or off your cell phone, you can remember, remember this brand, remember that, because there's so many brands out there. And I talk about that a lot too, in a different realm of saying like, people will start their day with all of that. Not no meditation, no time for themselves, the quiet time, the, the, none of that. All of that is going on as you start your day. And I'm like, wow. I, yeah, I tell people to try a digital detox, start your day. And it's hard for me too, but make a conscious decision like, for, you know, from this moon cycle to the next, or for all this week until, you know, I'll try it every day. Start 30 day, 30 minutes, my first 30 minutes or my mm -hmm. first hour, not touching my cell phone. Maybe put your cell phone in a whole nother room so it's not even in your bedroom. So when you wake up, you yeah. are reminded to do that. And, and come to find out most millionaires and billionaires, that's exactly what they're doing. They're out running at 6 a.m. By 8 a.m., they've had their breakfast, meditation, and before they start to get their email, especially on the East Coast, they're mm -hmm. already mentally, spiritually prepared. So, what? For me, I never had that problem being addicted to the social media because I'm older. I'm a little older, right? So I had that experience where you didn't wake up with your phone in your hand. Like, unless well, we you had probably, like, we you know, did have that. that. We did have clock right. radio. <laughs> right. But you didn't care about the internet and all of that stuff. So I like to start my morning with meditation. But most of the time, I'm usually up at night. I have a different schedule. But I start my day with meditation. I start my day, you know, just being quiet and listening to what I need to listen to because I don't know. I read this. You empty. need to hear your own voice. If you wake yeah, up, tomorrow I you just, just had can't. an amazing dream. Most people say, <laughs> I don't dream. No, you had a dream. You just woke up and went straight to social media and forgot whatever you just dreamed. You just slept for eight hours and three of it was REM. Uh, you had yeah. a dream. Yeah. Um, take the time to journal your dreams. Maybe something you missed subconsciously, unconsciously, and it came back to you, and maybe it is an answer to something you're, you could be going through today. Mm -hmm. So we're, I mean, especially us being melanated, we are very, very intuitive. So we really got to treat life a little bit differently. Did you even greet the sun? Did you take some time to honor, to do some sun salutation? I do yoga, <laughs> so I'm like, I'm up before the sun. And this morning I woke up at 3 o'clock. I said, Lila, get your life together. Go back to sleep. You know, I'm just like, I, I did my little exactly witching hour, that. what they call the witching hour, and I went to sleep. We had an earthquake this morning. I know. It I woke me so up out of my that sleep. It her bed. So I'm like, yo, normally I'm what? up at this time. I would have caught it because I'm waiting for the sun to come up. I uh -huh. love that little twilight, morning light when it's like that first rain starts to come, especially on the East Coast. You have a beautiful sunrise. It's very nice, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, I need to get into myself before the, the emails are coming through, before social media. And, and, you know, I really make sure I got to be on the right side of me. And it's mm -hmm. easier to say that, but you do need to make a decision. And I think um, if I can do it in a fast-paced work environment, because um, COVID did not stop business. COVID, you know, my, I had built a lean company with no large overhead. I didn't need all that extra stuff. Uh -huh. So we have moved a lot of our business to online anyway. Like you said, working with online media. We're talking about that, right. So when COVID hit, everybody's like, shit, we can't even go out. Excuse my language. But we got we to gotta engage with social media. We got to engage with, now Amazon, every day people are ordering Amazon. Amazon is just making so much money right now. They sure is, because I bought a few things. 
No, I'm like, every day is like, you have something, you got something, it's on the way, and it's shipping, and you'll get it eventually. And I'm like, oh, it's just, oh, I feel so, like, so many surprises. But it, I just hope people realize, like, yo, we're in the matrix. This, we're here. We're, this yeah. is the 21st it's century. Here. This is it. So let's act <laughs> like it. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. This is it. I'm just going to yeah. say hi in the comment section. So okay. yeah, yeah, like, yeah. You know, I've been inviting some people and some friends. Oh, that is so cool. Yeah, but my people that tune in to me, they know. We, we talk about it all the time. And it's like. I know. I tune in to you. Yeah, and it's just like, day. I really hate <laughs> that our people are so caught up in so much misinformation because misinformation is a war tactic as well. Mm -hmm. So at least is what I try to do on my all time or things that kind of like changed a little bit. I do want to sit down and talk to our people more about what's happening in the news. Because we, when you look at the G8 World Economic Summit, and you don't see us or no African leaders, mm -hmm. but they definitely talking about us. We're being <laughs> right. discussed. So it's one thing if they were just in their own little world, we had our own little world, but no, they're talking about how they're going to use our wage slave labor, how they're going to use our brothers and sisters. So I would really love for more of our people. Like, I'm the type of person, I'll go. I'll just go. Like I said, I'll service the media. Most of the times, I'm not making any money off of it, but I get it on the back end because now I'm in the room. Or the, mm -hmm. like you said, the people who you meet when you're there and you're networking. So right. I have to wear that journalism cap. If in the event of I'm not working with any PR clients right now, if I'm just Asian like a lot of other athletes, um, I love public relations. I love helping the media. Um, do they appreciate it? No. Does anybody appreciate anything in this perverse society? No. So, <laughs> no. you know, I just got to understand that we live in a very perverse society. Things are not fair. And at the end of the day, I'm so thankful for my life. And I think um, a lot of times I'll say this, propaganda is very powerful. I don't know if anybody's seen Watchmen, but definitely check it out. It's, it's talking about like the of a film and cinema. Mm -hmm. But it's an issue when our brothers and sisters are so quick to fight one another without hesitation, without any fear. But when I see Becky Karen yelling at us in the store or police want to do certain things to us, we can't think to fight back. We, we lose our mind. It's because, again, because of propaganda has put in our heads that they are the authority. Now, you know, that goes back to our imaging. They whitewash our stories, our narratives. So we don't see ourselves as kings and queens and rulers and politicians and authors and scientists until they do hidden figures. And they still had to add a little bit of fan fiction and put a white savior complex with Kevin Costner. And that character did not exist in real life. But my three sisters did. So they always so I'm out in Hollywood. There's a lot of doohickeys and, you know, a lot of I funny agree. stuff going on. So when I see it, I say something. But what kills me is this. When I'm fighting for my people and I'm fighting for our, my clients and our causes, and then they can't back me up. I got to go be the sacrificial lamb. So <laughs> I don't know who told y'all that you, you're going to eat over somebody else's sacrifice. I don't prescribe to that. If I'm fighting, I expect to reap the rewards and the benefits. If you cannot, if I'm fighting for you, and they're like, oh, Lila, just calm down. Don't be so mean to the Becky Karens who won't let us into the party, even though our name is on the list right there. We get a lot of that, too. Oh, I don't see you. Well, here's the email where you say I was approved with a confirmation number. You need to update your profile. You got technology. It's 2020. <laughs> get it together. Oh, Lila, calm down. You're being too mean to the races. You know, then that's when it's like, what the, what am I fighting for? <laughs> like, how does I don't even want to go to these events? You know, no, know it ends up being more work. But mm -hmm. I do appreciate when my clients, I've had clients that just didn't show up. I'm like, yo, you're doing the red carpet. You said you they just don't show up. But then I do know that there's another client or another talent that's maybe in waiting, just waiting for me to say, yes, I'll represent you. To say, come on to the Emmy pre-party, come on. The other one doesn't appreciate it, so I'll give it to the next in line. And that's my blessing to bestow. <laughs> <laughs> Blessings. I feel like a god Let out here. Blessings. You can go to the red carpet. You can to, I really feel like that sometimes. Let it rain. Um, what did I want to ask? I know you said something about fostering better relationships with the black yes, celebrities. Yes, that's what I was... I like, was so, yeah, kind of like, I, I, I was like, actually, too, like, that's a very interesting question. What made you come up with that question? <laughs> because you came up with that question. Okay, great. 
Great. All right. You back can, to me. No. You came honestly, up with this. No, you came up with the synopsis. Yeah. And I, I was just and thinking about some ideas we could talk about. Okay, so good. It was okay. Yeah. Um, no, I just think it's very interesting because you know, I'm, I'm kind of seeing the black celebrities in this town and everybody talking about Breonna Taylor. But do we ever start talking about things that could prevent the next George Floyd and Sandra Bland? We're not getting to the root of the issues. And I, and I love, our, I love our, our actors. I think they serve a purpose. But when we start giving 100% and 80% of our attention to actors, we have, and then I'm like, I'm an actor activist. No, you're acting like an activist. Yeah. Because the revolution yeah. would not be lanes. televised. It's different lanes, that's for sure. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. I really need for them to understand that. Um, I have to tell, I have to tell them sometimes, ouch, that thing you said in the media, it affected me in the following ways. And they're like, who, who are you? Because I'm in Hollywood, I see him all the time. So while everybody's getting the photo op, I'm like, yo, I remember that one time in that interview you had said that one thing. Well, that mm -hmm. hurts people like me. That hurts children in the hood. So I know you think you're far removed from it, but I will roll up on you at an event. You know what I'm saying? And they, I think sometimes they appreciate that because they don't know. They just think they're putting it out there. It's like the old, you know, journalism trick. It's like the uh, silver bullet theory. It's like we just put anything out there, you know, and it just, they accept it. But if you, can, if you ever run up on a celebrity, instead of just saying, yo, can I hold $5 or can I get a picture real quick? How mm -hmm. about letting them know how their art and their, you know, performance or their expression or whatever it is that they do, how it affects you? Because our children look up to these people. And so even when my sister moved out to Hollywood, I had to explain to her, she's like, girl, look at all these homes. I was like, that's, you know, celebrities live there, but that's a rental. Their agent rents that to them for as long as you're on contract. Though, you know, the record labels will fly people out. You can stay in this mansion for about I a month. I think it's some real nice apartment. Yeah, it's a trade out. Labels. You know, <laughs> yeah. your, your songwriting credits is worth $5 million. We'll let you stay in this one million dollar home but you're really worth <laughs> five true. million so right. it's a lot of trade-outs it's a lot of perks and i said like, girl these people out here living off perks and she did not <laughs> believe me until she started to see it for herself she was like oh my gosh like it's, it's really sad too but i don't want to bring up something tragic but when pop smoke was killed in the hollywood hills that was i looked at what was going yes. on and i was like and not too far from where Megan Stein uh -huh. got shot yeah that's I'm sad. like, yo, he was all on the Instagram posing with his money, mm -hmm. inviting all of Compton in the hood. I, it's like when people come out here, they just want to go straight to, where's boys in the hood? Mm -hmm. Where do they film boys? <laughs> no, you don't, trust me, you don't want to go over there. Yeah. So they started inviting all the boys in the hood. And then when that happens, but I was looking at the details, and I was like, that was John Mellencamp's house. You know, we all here living on this Airbnb lifestyle. Not to say that he deserved any of that, because that shit was tragic. And I was, I was so was awesome. becoming a huge fan awesome. of his. Yeah. But I started looking at it, and I was like, why you got to be stunting on black people? Ain't none of us got it like that until we are kings and queens and rulers and dictators again. I want to see us like emperors again. So why we got to be stunting on one another? That, why, why would I try to invoke jealousy and envy in my brothers and sisters? So you was at John Mellencamp's home posing like it's your home, I need for you to be honest because if you be honest and our kids won't chase that lifestyle, maybe more of our young adults will get into the world of PR time. and more business management as mm -hmm. opposed to always trying to be athletes and rappers. How about work on owning a label first and, or a, 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 a performance booking company? You know, go out there and, and find other ways because what ends up happening is they end up hiring the others because we, don't, we think that service is mundane. Oh, why would I want to be a microphone company? Why would I want to be a stereo company? All I'm doing is, is you know, working on stereos. Why would I want to worry about being a stage performer or, or builder, the person that builds sets? We, those are not mundane tasks. Those are million, billion dollar industries. So when we start thinking about all the vendors that it takes to put something in front of the camera, you know it's like one Beyonce and some background answers and whatever, but it's like 300 people on the credits, like you were saying that makes this movie or that makes this stage that or that makes this concert mm -hmm. happen. So mm -hmm. we all have a part to play. And then maybe you end up becoming the best speaker company in the world or the best micro. Maybe you invent some or you partner with somebody that has some new technology for microphones and headphones. Mm -hmm. Like, look at Dr. Dre making billions off the headphones. Headphones. That's you it. You're going to get it just off the music. That's that part. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. That's why I think I started these conversations first of all, because I, I don't know, it came off a of boredom probably. Like a lot of ideas, 
<laughs> <That's> <laughs> my head off of boredom. But I wanted to change the narrative a little bit with especially our Black men and this thing of, you know, they just can dribble the ball and do sports. And I love sports. I have to keep saying that I love, I absolutely love sports. That's not what I'm saying. We do more than just that. We are creators, like literally creators. And Black men, I, I know a lot of Black men who are great fathers and great husbands. And they're friends, great friends of mine. So I just wanted to bring on a lot of Black men because, of course, in this music industry, uh, is predominantly Black men. And then bring on my dope sisters. And you are definitely one Thank of you. them. Like, to be called master of PR, that is that is. That's huge. That oh, is, I, I know. That's know like that 10-year thing, the master of. See? I told him, never a slave. I, we are the masters. We really, we truly are. <laughs> like, you Thank know, you for bringing that up. <laughs> pro. I just recently had an interview, and he called me PR Pro, and that's cool. But master is a whole nother level, and I definitely, um, I just celebrate you because you definitely inspire me so much. And there are so many things that I change within my business and within myself. I mean, cause I think last time that we talked, we were, we talked for about a good two hours. And I was just like, I can do anything I want to do. <laughs> like, just, just do this. it. And you don't need permission. And if I step on some toes, sorry, ouch, whatever. No, it's, um, I, w I was just thinking about this before I got into the interview. When I was starting out, there was, uh, I started out in Atlanta, Georgia, and hip hop was just mm -hmm. really starting to make a comeback there. Yeah. Um, and I remember there was this one PR person, and she was kind of giving a lot of people static because she would throw a lot of events. So I mm -hmm. was getting in, I was like, boom, I'm going to knock her off her game. I'm coming in the game, I'm, I'm killing, I'm cutting heads off. And then so I was really grateful for a lot of the older people who kind of saw me as this like young buck, and they said, let's have a dinner. <laughs> And I was like the only new person, so I guess I was on the menu. But it was really like, let's have a dinner and let's talk. But they start to air their grievances as seasoned professionals. And I'm just listening and learning and kind of understand a little bit what they're going through. Yeah. And we made a commitment to each other that day that we would not, you know, shy seat each other at events. Like we would not give each other problems. We would not steal each other's clients. You know, we just really just went down our ABCs and made a commitment to one another. I wish that we would do that in more cities um, and like Los Angeles. And, but they do have these like PR brunches. And I'm like, where the fuck is my invitation? Yeah, I'm here <laughs> 11 this year. And I can teach y'all some things, but sometimes I gotta understand my power. I'm too powerful. And I will take over the whole thing. But it, a lot of times I'm like, oh, PR brunch. And then I'm seeing the article like, this girl's a PR. I'm like, maybe I should start doing my own PR. But I have to remember, you know, stay behind the scenes. Your clients really don't want to see why you was getting yourself pressed. Yeah. You didn't get your new client pressed. So yeah. it's a really tricky game right now. Like, publicists have publicists. Publicists are getting publicity. <laughs> But right now, I think I can, my clients can appreciate the fact that I get the job done. I just signed a client up for New York Fashion Week. And she's on this show called uh, Amazon's Making the Cut. And she's one of the only black girls on the show. I reached out to her. She's from Kansas. And I thought she was going to do it. And I was like, normally I would be like, girl, I signed you up for New York Fashion Week. Uh -huh. and today she was like, Lila, I don't even have time. I was like, oh, so I was right to do that back in the day. Just go ahead and sign my clients up for things. Yeah. Instead of, uh, and I'm thinking I'm being too proactive. And, she was, and I said, look, the deadline is August 1st, right? And she checked back today. I, I told her I had something for her, a gift. And she was like, can you go ahead and fill that form out for me? And I was like, see, I, already, I was already knowing she wasn't going to meet that deadline. So she didn't have, I forgot, she's never been to Fashion Week. I've been to plenty. She doesn't know, the, they asked her, what time do you want to present and show your collection? She don't know. Um, Girl, you want to go 10 a.m.? You know, that's when all the journalists wake up. You don't want to do an 8 a.m. show because everybody's going to miss it. You know, just little things like that. And so I'm really learning even still to trust myself. Yeah, I do come on strong, but I think at the end of the day, some people are so overwhelmed that they can use that extra hand. So, um, yeah, if you have if you have an aggressive publicist like me, learn to appreciate him or her. They are so creative, and they're not just working on your account either. If they can even spare you five minutes, appreciate it. Uh, five hours on your account a week, an hour a day. That's more towards the efforts of PR as opposed to not putting any effort towards media relations. That's, that's or, or, you know, fan relations or any type of engagement. That somebody's working on your behalf. So appreciate whatever they offer 
because one small blog, that person could be like, oh, I just want to get this person for my small blog. And then the next job, they work for the New York Times. Or they don't tell you. you please say that again. Yeah, like, like so I just had little that that bloggers. It's like, oh, do my fan blog. And my client would be like, okay, whatever. Boop, boop, boop. And they'd be like, yo, one of my friends is editor at um, Esquire. And they read it. They want to do a piece on because they really, or, or I just got a writing gig. And, you know, they want me to stay in this topic. Do you have any more clients? And then, you know, whatever. So, you know, I don't think anything's too small because I know with search engine optimization, once it's online. I say that all the time. I'm like, we're building your SEO. Like, I need you to answer this. The journalist is looking for this. It needs to be in, you know, usually you got to It's either a couple of hours or it might be. If the article is a little bit longer, it may be about 24 to 48, depending on how big the article is. But I love to be a part of that. But a lot of times, um, music artists don't get it. Well, they're not educated. It's like when the NFL <laughs> athletes, the rookie symposium, the NBA, the rookies are coming in. Yeah. They have an old vet, like a, you know, Herman Edwards or somebody will come and talk to them like, you young bucks, don't do this. <laughs> and don't spend all your money on chains. But they don't have anything like that in the music industry. It says, hey, we're going to have our, you know, we're going to have a, a new artist symposium and we're going to mm -hmm. talk to you about the importance of marketing. Because what ends up happening is, let's say that that person leaves that label. Like, you know, that's how Beyonce had her publicist for life. As they were disbanding, she got her publicist from the label. Oh, yeah. So a lot of yeah. times labels fold. You might switch, you might hate that label and go to another one. That publicist has to stay with that. That publicist has to also do the label PR for the CEOs, for the executives, for mm -hmm. other genres of music. You need a personal publicist. And why wouldn't you want a large team? Are you scared of paying out? Because if you got 10 people trying to help you make a million, then they, and then they all go out and get a million, now you got 10 million. It's exponential. Yeah. So stop worrying about it. that little couple thousand dollars here and there is, is going to matriculate. <laughs> it's an investment. And I always ask them, did you invest in your brand? Like, are you gonna, cause I can show you the advertising rates. <laughs> you might as well put that there. money towards a publicist. That's going to get you, like I said, merit-based media. Let's see. Am I missing anything? I know Professor KG was on here. Oh, God. She is so amazing. Like, she studies astronomy, and she's a music educator, and she does – she is a music producer. Like, she – Music theory. She's just, yeah. Like, she was phenomenal. We had a conversation a couple of weeks ago, and that was so great. I – um. I appeared on TV with uh, Dr. Oz and Bishop Jakes. I think, next, I think this was like two or three years ago. Yeah, I, I don't saw know. That I don't pay against, <laughs> Yeah. So the clip was Bishop Jakes came out with this book on, you know, how to soar. It was about soaring um, and being your best self pretty much in business as an entrepreneur. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, so I got, well, before we went out onto the show, he was talking about how a lot of um, black females, I mean, they're like starting businesses before you can, faster than you could put your socks on your feet, right? Mm -hmm. But they're not lasting. I know. I'm your last <laughs> <would be>, <laughs> So he said, Sharon Tell. Uh, you must be doing something right, being that you have made it this far 10 years, right? 10 years, not ever really advertising. Now I feel like I'm having fun with it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right? Here I am. I'm, I'm trying to build my SEO now. Like, this right. Is what I'm it's doing. like now we're going to focus on ourselves. We've been doing everybody else's <laughs> PR, and now it's like, I'm like, do I? No, it's time to do my personal PR. That's very true. Hashtag Sharon Tell Durskill. Yeah. What do you think are some of the reasons of why? Shout out to LA Radio Now. Mm -hmm. Um, what do you think some of the reasons of maybe why we are not lasting um in our black businesses? Because that was in our scenario. Oh no, it's strategic. <laughs> I tell black people, do you feel like a force is trying to stop you? It is. <laughs> it's strategic. No, I literally had a write-up yeah. one time. Um, I call Liz Mullen. She's covered all the labors and agents for Sports Business Journal. It's our trade publication. Mm -hmm. Only a couple hundred thousand or hundred to a few thousand people see it. Mm -hmm. So she was like, how do I not know about you? And I'm like, yo, I pitch you all the time. Every time I have a new client, she says, oh, this agent signed a new client. 
Well, she did an expose on me. She was like, I'm going to give you more than just you signed a new asset. I'm going to do like three or four paragraphs about what you're doing, how, where you come from, your business. Just write it up. Yeah. We don't know who you are. <laughs> when she, she did that, she called me back. She said, yo, I got so many phone calls from these white men. She's a white woman too, but she's like, from all these white men, because she's got to deal with them too in the industry. Right. She said they were pissed. <laughs> She was like, and I was like, did I write something wrong? Did, is she, or some, any of this information fraudulent? They was like, no, we just don't want to see her publicized. And so they don't want to see us flourish. They actually like, I, I've had people poach my clients. Like I went out and got a kayaking athlete. And then when I'm doing such a good job with him, some other agent, this, this one woman named Cheryl Shade, she's got all kinds of racism lawsuits out there. She's a yeah. sports agent. I'm like, Cheryl Shade, you care about kayaking now? You care about rowing and fencing? You care about these money? I just want some clients to get on the board. Because <laughs> they be winning medals that don't nobody even know. Like, our women's water polo team has been won like four years in a row of gold medals at the Olympics. Nobody cares. That's amazing. But the sponsors do, and I get my, I get my payouts. But it was so interesting. So I'm like, no, they are. It, it, it is policy. It's declassification. It's telling us we're from Africa, so we don't claim the land here. You know, a lot of our people are finding out that they're the natives, that they have land allotments and their inheritance. A lot of people are just not finding their inheritance. They burned down Black Wall Street. You know, I, you know, I'm discovering my roots, and I've been always new. But I, I didn't seen that. I was like, oh, I want to do yeah, it. Yeah, I'm Creek Muscogee, Cherokee <laughs> Nation. That's exactly the land of Black I'm Wall Street. Tulsa Oklahoma is Creek Muscogee on Cherokee Nation. They, this is all about economics. Our enslavement was about economics. It was about mm -hmm. economics. So they don't want us in their system. And I don't want to be in a system that would not use my genius. Our people are fascinating. We are, you see it in colors to hidden figures. We yeah. are geniuses. Okay. So at the end of the day, why would I want to be a part of a workforce that doesn't use the creative genius? I, I, I've seen 12 year old melanated geniuses who ain't had no resources to do anything with. And they come out there and, and solve the world's puzzling mysteries. So I want to side with those people. I want to work with those people. If we work in a labor force that says black women are the overeducated, overworked, but underpaid, then why would I want to contribute to that economic system built on system genocide man. and yeah. slavery? So we got to really, we got to stand up for yeah. ourselves first and foremost and say, I don't want to be begging no Becky for no job. I, I just feel like my mom instilled that in me. She said, don't you ever work for no man and don't you definitely don't ever work for no woman. And I was like, okay. But I'm thinking I'm going to go to school, be, you know, get some business courses and work for corporate. They wasn't trying to hire my militant ass and I didn't realize it. They were like, where do you see yourself in 10 years taking over this company? Uh, okay, thanks. I was like, that was a great answer. Taking your job. That's what you see. That, that's my vision. And so I was like, oh, no, I don't want to take over yours. If I have to take over yours, that means I can build up mine. So, you know, I just didn't realize that I was coming on so strong. I, mean, I was so very, sad. very, you know, aggressive. But I was really trying yeah. to get the job. But I was like, thank goodness I didn't get hired. So Our the reason businesses are so not fast. doing well is because we are excluded from loans and all kinds of things. Oh, yeah, that's true. Our hour went so fast. I know. I'm so mad about that. <laughs> we have to do like a part two. We have to <laughs> talk about how do we help our businesses grow? What should we be focusing on? How can we change that narrative and hold on to that? Can we talk more about the psychological warfare and really go deep into? Oh yeah, you know, we definitely need to do that. Thing, that like, don't. Right? I'm holding you to that because we need to do no, a part really, two no, because really. it's strategic and it's hurting our people. Down. Yeah, we need so some good power. Yeah, we really need to do a part two if you're okay with that because that's important. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thank you for having me. And look, that's free consultation, free hour consultation. We did it. We service our community. Thank it. you so much for having me. And thank you so much for giving me your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Thank you for chiming in.